This meeting is being recorded. Good evening and welcome to tonight's session. So what is tonight's session about? It's an introduction to apprenticeships for Oxfordshire parents. Obviously, if you are a parent and you're not in Oxfordshire, but you found yourself on this session, you are more than welcome to stay and learn about apprenticeships. But why is it Oxfordshire? Because not only are we going to talk about apprenticeships, what you can achieve, what are they like, what do you do? But we're talking about those that are available in the Oxfordshire area so that we understand what we can do, what we can achieve, where we can go. And it's about understanding maybe what our children are looking at. What are they thinking about for their future? What is this apprenticeship that they keep talking about that didn't exist when I was at school? It certainly didn't exist when I was at school. And these are the things that we want to know. I, before we hit the record button, I asked everybody to find the chat box and the Q&A box. Please find it and make sure you can use it because as we go through the sessions, we're going to meet four different speakers. The chat box is there so that we can interact as we go along. We may ask an ad hoc question, but the Q&A box is the really important one because I want you to put your questions in there. Yes, at the end, we have a Q&A session, but I don't like to wait till the end for questions and answers to, to, to happen. If you've got a question as you go through and it comes into your mind, put it in the Q&A box because it stays there until we're ready to answer it. It might be then, it might be later, but at least then you've got it out and it's there. So you don't get to the end and go, oh, what was that question I was going to ask? And you've forgotten. So find the Q&A box. Some of you have already. Find the chat box. Plenty of you have already, which is fantastic. It does say raise your hand and ask a question. If you want to ask, if you can, um, if your microphone works and you're confident and comfortable and you want to do that, do that. Otherwise, use the chat, use the Q&A. Lots of ways of communicating to make you comfortable. So who am I? My name is Max. I work for Pathway CTM. Um, we work with different organizations, uh, but the Ox Leppers asked us to help host the session tonight. So my job tonight is to look after Q&A, look after the chat to make sure that everything runs smoothly. I'm not the main event. I'm the one that just sits in the background and I make things happen. The main event is the four speakers that we've got that are going to be from different areas, all Oxfordshire, but talking about different things. And we're going to meet them one by one. Ask questions as we go. Like I said, please don't hesitate to put them in the Q&A box. First up, we're going to meet Leah, who's from, uh, she as you can see it there, says the Oxlep Apprenticeship Advisor, and we'll hand over to Leah in a short while. We've got Hannah, who's come from Ignite Sport, and she's going to talk about what her organisation does and about apprenticeships and a few different things. Then you're going to meet Erin, who works at Oxford Biomedica. Again, as you can see a theme here, yes, it's Oxfordshire. Ellie, who works at the University of Oxford. You might be a bit confused thinking, but if this is about apprenticeships, why is there somebody from a university here? You're going to find out when Ellie speaks. It's all relevant. And then we've got the Q&A session at the end. But like I said, flow, flow the questions through the session because it makes for a better session and more exciting. And then we'll have a little closing poll at the end. What's a closing poll? It's just asking you some questions about what you've heard and what you think going forward. So now I'm going to ask you to answer some questions. I'm going to launch an opening poll. You will see it appear on your screen now. If you're looking on a mobile phone, excuse me, if you're watching on a mobile phone, the button might be at the top, but find it. It says polls, click on it. Answer the questions that are there. And what you will see is that the questions, they're there. Once you click submit, the answers will come through. OK, the questions are, tell us which of these applies to you. Are you a parent? Are you a carer or guardian? Are you a teacher, careers advisor? I've put years in there as well in case your students like year 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, because you never know who finds these sessions. And I know that students are resourceful and can find, find these sessions and come on to them to get information, which is great. And how much do you know about apprenticeships? Let's be honest here. How much do you know about apprenticeships? Some of you might know a lot. Some of you might know hardly anything. And that's why you're here. You need to know. You maybe got a son or daughter keeps going on about apprenticeship. And like, I don't know what this is. Educate me. That's why you're here. And I've asked a question, which is, which route, if you're a student, are you thinking of taking? But if you're a parent, what route is your child thinking of taking? OK, are they looking at university degree, degree apprenticeship? Do they want to go straight into work? Are they looking at other level of apprenticeships? Do they want to take a gap here? Are they not sure yet? Do you know what? That's absolutely fine. It's absolutely fine if you don't know, because if everybody knew everything, I'd be out of a job. OK, simple as that. The other question I normally ask is, which region are you from? But we're assuming this is Oxfordshire, that you're all from the same region. So we're going with that. We're almost there. I'm going to give it another 30 seconds to get some answers through. And then we'll move on and we're going to meet Leah. We're almost there. I'm going to give it 15 more seconds.
The other thing I will say is if you are a parent and you're watching with some of your children, one, two, three, however many, just put it in the chat box if you are and how many children you've got with you. Even if you're a teacher and you've got a few students with you, let us know. OK, let's share the answers to these polls. Share the results. You'll see them come up on your screen. 73% are parents. Brilliant. 1% are carers or guardians. 1% are teachers. 3% are year 9. 7% are year 10. 8% are year 11. 3% are year 12. 4% are year 13. Brilliant. Good. 78% hardly know anything. That's why they're here. They want to know more. 22% know a fair amount about apprenticeships. But there's still more than they need to know. 0% know pretty much everything there is to know. Good. You're in the right place. And what are we thinking of doing after leaving school or college? Or what are our children thinking? 30% are looking at a university degree. 12% are looking at a degree apprenticeship. 3% straight into work. 9% are looking at other level apprenticeships. Okay. 1% are thinking about a gap year. 45% are not sure yet. Good. I've got four speakers. They know they've got their work cut out. But by the end of it, you're going to be fully upskilled and amazed and, and fully knowledgeable and hopefully confident and excited about apprenticeships, degree apprenticeships that are in the Oxfordshire area. And to help me do that, the first person I'm going to introduce is Leah from Oxlet. So, Leah, welcome to the session. How are you? Take it away. Thank you, Max. Hi, everyone. So I'm Leah and I'm an apprenticeship advisor who works with Oxlet Skills. Um, I'm here to tell you more about apprenticeships and give you a general overview. Um, so I understand that as parents and carers, we're all really keen to hear what options are available for our children. Um, I've got a year 10, I was going to say student, child myself. So I'm completely with you on kind of finding out the range of options that are available. Um, really pleased to see that there are some young students here as well. Um, so I think for you, it's great that you're kind of thinking about what to do next. An apprenticeship is a really, really good option. If I can have the next slide. Also, we're here because um, you may or may not know that this is National Apprenticeship Week for 2023. So there'll be lots of events to, taking place all week right through to Friday. Um, so apprenticeships, what are they? Apprenticeships might have changed over the past few years. As parents, they might be completely different to maybe what you remember growing up and being younger. I think sometimes we assume apprenticeships are construction, plumbing, electrical, those kind of vocational um, areas. But actually, there's such a vast range of apprenticeships that are available. They are seen as a real job with a real employer. And the, the apprentice will work while studying towards a qualification. Um, the great thing about apprenticeships is that you will be paid a salary um, and it can be a pretty good salary. Typically, you would be paid minimum wage. So at the moment, that's £4.81 per hour. That's actually rising from April this year to £5.28. But the good thing is that many employers actually pay a little bit more than national minimum wage. Um, so basically, you do have a contract of employment. You will be entitled to holiday pay, sick leave, annual leave. So all the other entitlements that employers have within a business. Typically, with an apprenticeship, the idea is that you spend 80 percent of your time on the job, so working and then 20% of your time called off the job. So that's where you study and complete the work that's needed for your apprenticeship. I know Hannah's going to explain a little bit more about that kind of setup a little bit later and the structure behind that. But basically, um, apprenticeships are jobs with the study element attached to them. Um, the study does take place with a training provider um, and they will help you achieve your qualification. Training providers could either be colleges, universities, or it might be an independent training organisation. Can I have the next slide, please? So as you can see, there is a wide range of different levels within the apprenticeship framework. So there are four columns that you can see there. So we, we go from intermediate, level two, right through to degree level apprenticeships up to level six and seven. 
you can see what they compare to in terms of other qualifications that are also out there. So for example, a level three, which is known as an advanced apprenticeship, would be the same as completing your A-levels or your B-level or the new T-level qualifications that are also out there. Um, apprenticeships typically last between one to four years. 12 months would be the minimum. Um, the duration really depends on the level of the apprenticeship and obviously then how much there is to learn. Um, there are 600 plus standards, so 600 different apprenticeships that are out there that range from the intermediate right through to the degree level. And there's some fantastic opportunities that are available at the moment. Can I have the next slide, please? So this just gives you an idea of some of the ranges of apprenticeships that are available to you. Um, so anything within the health sector, so becoming a nurse is a great new apprenticeship that's a nurse associate. Um, there's a doctor, you can now train to be a doctor, so that's a brand new apprenticeship that has come out right through to your sports apprenticeship. So within sports, it could be um, coaching, safety, media and art. So you've got the creative um, studies options, engineering, um, and many more kind of sectors that are available. Can I have the next slide? Okay, so equally, the range of employers offering apprenticeships is incredible. Um, you can see on this slide, you've got some big, well-known names, and you've also got names of businesses, again, big and smaller, that are within the Oxfordshire area. So these are all businesses that we know of that offer apprenticeships. Some of these, okay, what, that's fine. So looking um, inside the company. So if you took one of those, um, businesses. So if we took Blenheim Palace, for example, they would have a whole range of varying apprenticeships that would be available. It could be right through to something like facilities management, gardening, estates, through to business, human resources, planning events, marketing. So when you're really looking at a business, it's, it's a good idea to kind of narrow it down to what type of apprenticeship you're really looking for. And, and just to appreciate that one business will have a whole range of apprenticeship options. Next slide, please. So what's available near us within Oxfordshire? So I can tell you, I did a search at the beginning of this week, and I'll tell you how to do the search and where to find this. But within five miles of Oxford, you can see that there are 70 vacancies. And if you extend the distance in which you're looking, you'll see that those number of apprenticeship opportunities do go up. So obviously you need to bear in mind where you can get to and where transport allows for apprentices to get to. But this is really encouraging that the number of apprenticeships are actually growing within the local area. Leah, can I just say something? Because obviously yeah. you did that search, you did that search on the 6th of February. So that's currently what is live now and is being yeah. recruited now. But yeah. I think obviously we both know that there's going to be more available, but it depends when you look because of the way that apprenticeships open. So that's currently live at the moment. That's what there is. But that doesn't just mean that's for the whole year. There will be more and more at different times of the year. And that's really important to think about for parents that when you look at those numbers, you may think, well, there's more places at university or whatever. Yes, there is. But this is just on one day. You could go back and the next week and there would be a whole lot more that have opened up as well and some will have been filled. So bear that in mind and keep looking. Okay, can I just say some statistics that I have, first of all, for Oxfordshire before we move on to the video. So we carried out some research and we can tell you that 95% of apprentices within Oxfordshire do go into long-term employment. 100% of those studying a higher level apprenticeship have led to long-term employment. 
And then just if you think about our area and what's available within Oxfordshire and our county. So we've got people that are designing life-saving vaccines. So with the, what happened through the COVID pandemic, we've got lots of space tech, self-driving cars, and some of the most popular video games have been designed within this county. Local growth sectors, so what's growing and where apprenticeships are really coming up are within the space sector, life sciences. Um, life sciences includes things like research assistants, biomedical scientists and biotechnologists. Um, construction is obviously huge in the area, area, digital and creative, health and so social care, and motorsport and advanced engineering. So we've got some real kind of sectors that are growing within the local area. We're just gonna play you a little clip of a video that we recently recorded. Oxfordshire! What does it mean to you? The universities, Oxford United, home. There's much more you probably don't even know about. Maybe you're thinking of going further afield when you leave school, but your future could be right on your doorstep. Let me show you in this WOW show special about careers in Oxfordshire. We're at Harwell, the UK's leading science, innovation and technology campus. This is one of nine technology and business parks in Oxfordshire. Harwell alone has over 200 organisations and 6,000 people. They could fill half of Kassam Stadium. Let's take a look around. We're outside the Rosalind Franklin Institute. Inside here, they're researching brand new medicine to try and treat the untreatable. And over there, this is the diamond light source. There's nothing else like it in the UK. It creates intense light beams 10 billion times brighter than the sun. Or here at Open Cosmos, where they're making and testing satellites to go into space. Their focus is tackling some of our planet's biggest challenges. If you're interested in space, energy, or health technology, this is the place to be. Everyone at Harwell is helping make the world a better place. Or maybe you want to save lives and help people. We're home to some of the UK's largest NHS teaching hospitals, training our future doctors and nurses for the front line, and also providing community and mental health services for people of all ages. Perhaps you're more creative. At Rebellion, they publish books and comics, make film and TV, and are one of the biggest independent game developers in Europe. They're always on the lookout for new talent. What about a career where you could help save the planet? At Green Corps, they're leading the green revolution in construction by building zero carbon homes to combat climate change. Haven't grabbed you yet? Stick with me. Oxfordshire is at the heart of the iconic Motorsport Valley, which has 4,300 different companies, including the world-famous Williams F1 racing team. Maybe you can help them build their next world championship winning car. Or you could be part of the team that's shaping the future of mobility with autonomous vehicle company Oxbotica. You may be able to help in more ways than you think. Whether you're interested in science, art, business, history, whether you like working on your own or in a team, there could be a role at all of these companies for you. And the opportunities just go on. There's publishing, tourism with Blenheim Palace and Vista Village, Thames Valley Police, and back to where we started. The universities employ over 18,000 people between them. All these employers are looking for young people to join them, whether as a trainee, apprentice or graduate. So remember, whoever you are, whatever your interests, your fabulous future could lie right here in Oxfordshire. Thank you.
So That's as you can see, company. there are just some amazing opportunities within the local area. So how do you find an apprenticeship? Um, so the first thing we would suggest is that you register on Find an Apprenticeship on um, apprenticeship.gov.uk. Uh, have a look on there and it will give you all of the vacancies. Um, but also one kind of one stop better, one step better than that is um, oxme.info. So this is a local Oxfordshire website that pulls off all of those local, local vacancies and puts them into one place. Um, as Max said earlier, it's important to keep looking because what vacancies are there this week will change in a month's time. So there are vacancies that are all being added on a kind of rolling basis, so keep checking. If I can have the next slide. Um, other places to look. So if you know there's a company that you're particularly interested in, look at their website. Um, many web, um, company websites will have a section for apprenticeships. Look at their social media, talk to your family, talk to your friends, talk to your careers advisors in school. Um, parents, talk to, to your children as well, obviously, to find out what interests them. And as I say, keep looking on company websites and do your research. Next slide. Um, other resources that are available for you as parents. So there's a great podcast that are available at the moment if you look at the parent perspective. Um, look also if you scan this QR code, and I think Max will send slides afterwards, but that will take you straight to the apprenticeship web page. Um, and the next slide gives you a few more examples. Um, amazingapprenticeships.com is another free resource that's really great to look at. Um, and then Oxlep, we have a Find Your Future platform. So you can go within that and that's a, a virtual experience where you can go to booths and look at various different organisations. Um, also, just to let you know that Oxlep are also running the Careers Fest. Um, at Kassam Stadium on the 22nd of March. And there's a parent session from 3.30 to 6.30. Um, you can register through Eventbrite. I'll put the link in slightly later um, this evening once I finish talking, that, but that does some great employers that will be going to that. I think we've got about 70 employers. Okay, next slide, I think is my last one. That was it. It's not. That's it. So thank you very much. And over to Hannah. Fantastic. What I'm going to do, Hannah, welcome to the session. I'm going to take the screen off so we can see you and hear you properly. Um, and Hannah's going to, going to continue with more information about apprenticeships, about training providers as well. So, uh, so Hannah, welcome to the session. Thank you very much for coming along. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Delighted to be here. Um, so following on from Leah, I just want to pick up on a couple of specifics and then I'll sort of go through my script. Um, the stats about the current vacancies, um, we don't even advertise as a business in terms of actually sort of putting them out there. We sort of rely on our networks, word of mouth, our links with our careers, uh, colleagues, our links with Oxlep, such as events tonight. So actually the bit of advice that you saw there on the slides about saying talk to companies, talk to your careers, people talk to other parents, follow Oxlep's lead in terms of find your future platforms. As a company, that's where you will find us. But there'll be other loads and loads and loads of other companies who who do that because we we find we don't need to advertise per se. Um, we, we use Oxfordshire Networks because it's so so effective and so comprehensive. Um, and the final thing I'm going to say, although it's a very young people audience tonight with parents and carers for sort of broadly teenagers, um, you don't just have to be young to be an apprentice. Um, so if there is a parent or carer or someone else in extended family or older sibling, I don't know, that you're thinking, well, hey, it would be great to do an apprenticeship. That's fab because you can do an apprenticeship at any age. I'll give you a bit of a, a home story. I'm 51, I'm on a level five leadership and management apprenticeship. And there are other colleagues my age in our business who are, who are doing them as well. So if you are a little bit at the older, older end of, of the audience tonight, don't, don't rule yourself out either. But I will focus on young people now. So, um, Back to my script. So I work for Ignite Sports UK. We're an Oxfordshire-based uh, private company. 
I'm currently sat at Oxford City Football Club. That's that's where we are based. We don't just do football. We do apprenticeships across the piece, but we do have a lot of demand because we have a lot of people interested in football. So we're based at Oxford City in Marston and uh, Ignite Sport UK has been going uh, circa 25 years. Now we are both, we have both angles. We are an employer of apprentices. So I'm gonna talk about what we look for in our, in our recruits, but we're also a training provider. So we provide the education, that 20%, what we call off the job training that has to be included in every apprenticeship. So, so we do both, we employ and we train and our training arm is called Ignite Training. So um, we train our own apprentices, but we also train other businesses, other companies, apprentices. So we have that unique position to be able to see both what we call on the job, the 80% and the off the job, the 20%. So I'll hopefully share with you for a few minutes about how that works. So if I start off, first of all, with as an employer, what are we looking for in, in people coming forward? And I use young people because that's, that's the audience tonight. Now, Although I work in the sports sector, I think, I hope what I'm gonna to say tonight are completely transferable to all sectors. Uh, and if you're in, not into sport, please don't switch off because I, I, I genuinely believe that what I'm about to say about what we're looking for, the skills that any employer would be looking for. So when a young person is interested in a friendship with us, however they found us, the first and most important thing that I'm looking for are those soft skills, those people skills. I talk about the ability to communicate, to be able to talk. I'm looking for a level of confidence. Now I know young people, 16, 17, 18, that doesn't naturally come, and especially with the last couple of years where, where I believe confidence has been knocked, but I'm looking for a sort of potential confidence, looking for a bit of enthusiasm, passion, desire. Because I want someone who comes to me looking for an apprenticeship to know a little bit about me and my business and about sport and about Ignite, just as if you're going to do a, an apprenticeship at, at BMW or at Blenheim. You're going to want to show some passion and enthusiasm for that service, that, that area, that industry. So looking for a bit of passion and enthusiasm. I'm looking for a young person, especially with a desire to want to be ready to work. And I know it's quite hard at 16, 17, 18 to be ready for work, but someone who perhaps has a bit of work experience, voluntary or paid. Someone perhaps who's showing a level of maturity who understands that this is an employment contract. It's a job. It's a step into the grown up world of working. Now, obviously, you're supported heavily to learn how to work, but I want someone who's ready to want to learn how to work. And I want, I, I use the phrase, we want people that, are, that sort of come across as a sponge want to absorb all the experiences you know they're going to be shadowing they're going to be mentored they're going to be working alongside more experienced people and someone who's a sponge who's going to want to go oh, I want to learn that wow that says wants to ask questions inquisitive natures nature so that's sort of the skills that so if you're thinking about applying for an apprenticeship however wherever whoever whatever they're the employability skills that we're looking for sort of seeds of positivity regarding now, I would say, and to all the young people on the call, that is not instead of GCSE results. <laughs> I don't want anyone to think that I'm saying GCSE results don't matter or A-level results don't matter or BTEC results don't matter. Of course they do, they're really important. But an apprenticeship is, is, is not solely about attainment of exam results. And it's really important to, to understand that. I will just talk for a second about maths and English. Um, it's really, 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 really helpful if everyone on this call can aspire to a grade four or above in maths and English. However, I will say for Ignite, and I'm talking on behalf of Ignite, to access a level two apprenticeship, which is intermediate, as Leah said. If you don't come with a grade four in maths and English, we will do functional skills with you. You need to get a minimum of a level one, ideally a level two, which is equivalent to a grade four. So it's not a deal breaker without maths and English but it makes life awful lot easier. So please keep your heads down students on this call and get your fours and then you, you, you upwards and then you, you've done it. So that's a little bit about what we're looking for as an employer. So just in terms of as an employer, how, how we work with apprentices. Um, and then you'd like to think any employer would do the same. We don't just chuck you out there in the world of 
sport, coaching in schools, running sessions on Saturday mornings. You very much are mentored, supported, guided, um, handheld, until you get to a point where you're ready to fly solo in whatever it is that you're doing. So in our world, it would be coaching a session of, to children, could be football out on the pitch. But you're not just pushed out there and go off you go, because that would lead to failure and demotivation and also it wouldn't be safe. So very much apprenticeships are about support and, and, and hand-holding and nurturing you to get those, what we call knowledge, skills and behaviours honed to the level of apprenticeship you're doing. So you don't need to worry, oh my God, it's really scary. You're supported to do well in your job role. The other thing I would say, and this has already been touched upon, uh, is as an, as an employer, we are duty bound to treat you really well. So we have to offer you a minimum of 30 hours a week on a contract, and we have to offer you a minimum of 12 months, and obviously upwards depending on the level. And we have to pay you the minimum of £4.81 an hour, going up to 5 28 in April. And we're not allowed to not do that. So you know if you're going on to an apprenticeship, the minimum per month, I've just done the maths while I'm sitting here, the minimum per month that you would take home currently is £625 a month. That's 481 times 30 hours a week. Okay. And then obviously some employers pay more and contracts can be longer, but so there's, there's minimum. So you can start to work out budgets and stuff. And I would say a bit of advice to anyone, if, if you are seeking an apprenticeship and you're not hearing the employer talk in those terms, then you, you need to question and challenge, but all good employers will, they have to. The other thing we have to do as an employer, but this is great, is that we have to make time in your timetable for your education. And that's, again, it's compulsory. And it's 20%, as Leah said. So if you think about a 30 hour a week contract, 24 hours a week would be on the job, doing the job. So sports coaching or engineering or your hairdressing or your plumbing or your dentistry doctor. So 24 hours minimum is doing the job. And then six hours minimum would be allocated to your education. And that's all within your paid for 30 hours. So you can't have an employer saying to you, oh, you're doing 30 hours on the job, but when you can do your education at home in the evenings when it suits you it's within the working week and that's really important so that's sort of a little bit about as an employer how we have to operate how we look after you what we pay and then if I go into the education side so just to reiterate 20 percent so approximately six hours a week on a 30 hour a week contract is allocated to your education and that could take many forms and if there was ever, if there is ever one positive from COVID, and I possibly think this might be the only one, if there was ever one positive that has stemmed from COVID, it is us as training providers, as educators, now using technology to support education being delivered in a much more flexible and virtual way. But what I mean is, back before COVID, the six hours of education for our apprentices and other people's apprentices would be delivered on site in a classroom like where I am now everyone physically traveling to a venue and sitting in a classroom for the six hours. We no longer need to do that. We do some face-to-face, -face, don't get me wrong, there's a huge merit in face-to-face -face delivery of education, but actually we can use platforms and we use Teams, we use Zoom to do online sessions. So you could do an hour with a group of students. They could go off, do a bit of coursework, come back for another hour, have a break, or do a two hour block, two hours independent study during the week. So we can be much more flexible at how we support the education delivery. And so someone living, well, we're based at Oxford City here in Marston, someone living in Banbury, or someone living in Wallingford, or someone living in Carterton, quite decent journeys to get, you know, quite long journeys to get into, into to the classroom. Actually, that's taken up time and effort and energy and resource. Actually, we can do virtual support. They don't need to travel and be just as effective. So the whole nature of now being able to educate virtually and using platforms, and we've got online portfolios and online portals where work is uploaded, can really suit young people where they're not driving, transport can be hit and miss, and they can still get their education re really successfully delivered. So that's that's blended, we call that blended learning nowadays, mixture of face-to-face -face and online, and complement each other nicely. So just a few more things, and I'll shut up. Um, 
as an example, as an employer, like it was, it was alluded to earlier, Blenheim, we're a lot smaller than Blenheim, obviously, but we, we deliver a range of apprenticeship standards as well. And it's quite common for most employers and training providers to deliver a range. So we do a level two community sport. So level two is intermediate. So community sports coach, we do a level three teaching assistant. We do a level four sports coach. We do a level five leadership and management. And they're our current suite and we're looking to grow that as well. So there is actually a chance for real progression. For example, with a business like us, you know, join at a two, do a three, do a four, or come in a bit older after A-levels, come in at level three, come in after university and do a level five. But there is quite, we do offer quite a lot of different apprenticeship standards. Um, and there is really something for everyone. There literally is something for everyone. Um, final couple of points. Um, Again, it's just myths, myth busting. You can get to university with an apprenticeship. So we have loads of examples of, of individuals doing a level two and a level three, so an intermediate and an advanced, and then accessing a foundation degree, just as you can do degree apprenticeships. So if you want to do a traditional HE route following sixth form, you could do, for example, a level two apprenticeship, level three apprenticeship, typically 12 months each, and access HE. Don't necessarily get enough of your cast points to go straight onto an honours degree, but you can get enough of your cast points definitely to get onto foundation degrees. And we've got proof of that with students come going from here to Oxford Brooks to do their brilliant sports degrees. OK, and very last thing. Um, back to my point I started with about how do you find apprenticeships like what we offer and other companies? I say we don't advertise because we don't necessarily need to in a, in a traditional sense through job boards. We work as, with partners like this, events such as this. We also show up at work experience, uh, we also show up at um, careers events in individual schools. So if your school you're at or your cluster of schools, because they often work in partnerships, are having careers events, get yourself along to them because you will meet people like us in their stands talking tonight, like we are tonight, about apprenticeship opportunities. And those careers evenings, I know you might think, oh my God, do I have to go? It's actually a really great way of meeting loads of potential employers and finding yourself an apprenticeship. The other final thing I'd say is, youngsters on this call, please, please, please use work experience opportunities. Try and find work experience that is in tune with what you're thinking you might be looking to do. We get most of our apprentices through coming on year 10 work experience or year 11 in some schools, and then they like us, we like them, and then they join us at the start of year 12. So if you get the chance to do work experience in whatever sector, use it. Because if you do a really good job for that week or two weeks, that's your interview. You're in the door. And then makes the application process much smoother because they obviously know you. I think I'll stop. Thank you. That's been a lot of good information, Hannah. And what I want parents to think about there is you're starting to get an insight into more of these, these things in these areas. And one of the really important things, we saw that table at the beginning, the matrix of how does... Uh, you know, the equivalent level two is equivalent to what level three is equivalent to what it's, it's clear to say one thing that students say to me a lot is how can I do a level two or a level three after GCSE if it's 80 percent working and 20 percent studying because I need to be in full time education until I'm 18. They don't quite say it like that, but along those lines, the government recognizes a level two and a level three as full time education, even though you are working in a real job 80 percent of the time and 20 percent is studying. So that point that you made, Hannah, that you can then go on. And universities and companies doing degree apprenticeships will look at your level twos and level threes. And that counts towards being able to go and start a degree. So do look, that opens up a whole world of options that you need to be aware of and think about. And I can see Leah nodding and Hannah, you're nodding as well. These are the things that we need you to think about. One question for you, though, um, Hannah, we talked about it. How important is it to have those skills or to talk about those skills in interviews if you're going for an apprenticeship, not just your grades? Well, I if I'm honest, you know, that, that matters to me so much more than, than the grades, because this is, you're applying to be a job and learning on the job. Um, now, of course, there are some, some higher level apprenticeships where the, the grades are essential, and I understand that. But I, if I'm talking from our sector, you know, we're a people's industry. So we're, if you like, like people working in sport, we're like hospitality or retail. We're front of house, we're facing, we're people. We don't do anything other than people. So all I'm, I'm looking for people skills, those soft skills. For all the young people that are on this call, again, I'll say it, just give me a bit of eye contact. Don't hide behind your fringe. Don't wear a hoodie. Try and smile. Be yourself. 
talk to me about sport, practice in the mirror at home, give it, do an eye contact. A bit awkward talking to a stranger about yourself, but that's what we need to see. And it's practice and confidence. So yeah, those people skills, soft skills, I just want to see a glimmer that they're there and then we'll pull them out during the apprenticeship. Absolutely. So that's the important thing to remember for parents as well, that when we're talking about uh, apprenticeships, when we're talking about the application processes, it's not all around the grades. The grades are important. Yes, of course, they have those skills. What are they doing in the extracurricular activities? Do they do stuff at home? Do they care for younger brothers and sisters? Do they do sports? What is it? And remember that uh, a Pathway CTM, we help students prepare for this kind of stuff. And there are a lot of organisations that do it as well. And there's so many different ways to do it. You, anybody going for an interview is going to be nervous especially when you've never done one before so let's get that practice in and let's get those things going and try it before you get there fantastic Hannah thank you so much for that really really appreciate it I will say one thing for the session it's 6 40 we've got two speakers to go in questions it might not finish at seven o'clock but stick around because we're going to go through the questions and there's plenty of time there um a lot of the questions are being answered as we speak and uh, and you can see that as well which is fantastic. Now we're going to go over to Oxford Biomedica, and I'm sure you've heard of them before. Um, and uh, and we're going to meet somebody from Oxford Biomedica, and that person is Erin. And hopefully, Erin's camera is going to appear, and we can hear her. There we go. Hello. Erin, welcome to the set. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So yeah, I'm Erin, and I'm a technician scientist apprentice at Oxford Biomedica. I'm currently a year two apprentice, also studying a foundation degree at the University of Kent alongside my apprenticeship um, and how I got into my apprenticeship I finished sixth form three years ago and I applied for university but I took a gap year and I worked for the year at, um, at a nanotech company as a lab technician and after having a taste of full-time work I really didn't fancy just going into full-time study um, so I found my apprenticeship with Oxford Biomedica um, so next next slide please <laughs> Uh, so I'm just going to be talking about um, who we are as a company, what we do, the apprenticeships we offer, the university training provider partners we have, um, a supporting agency called Catapult, um, a bit about my journey and what I think the pros and cons are of choosing an apprenticeship over university. So next slide, slide please. Uh, so just a few facts about Oxford Biomedica. We were founded in 1996 as a spin-off from the University of Oxford. Um, and we have recently gone over to um, Boston to look into a different type of viral vector. Um, our mission is to de deliver life-changing gene therapies to patients. We've created a lent effective platform that's industry leading. Um, we were the first in the world to administer in vivo therapies, which means that our vaccines and therapies go straight into the organ, whether that be the brain or the eye. Um, we've created a Lentivector technology called Kimraya, which treats um, leukemia in children. Um, and we've treated many thousands of patients. Um, the company currently employs 31 apprentices. Um, our most popular apprenticeship is the level five technician scientist course, which I'm on. There's currently 19 of us. So there's a good community there. And this year we won apprentice employer of the year, which was quite an achievement. Next slide, please. <laughs> So I'm just going to talk about a bit about what we do. So like I said, we manufacture saline gene therapies to treat genetic diseases. Um, so as you may know, proteins make up the human body and we need DNA sequences and genes to allow our bodies to do this and make the proteins. Um, and sometimes errors can occur in these gene sequences. Um, and these mutations can be harmless um, and they usually are. Um, but some can cause disease, which makes you produce proteins that are inactive or abnormal. Um, we then move on to viral gene therapy and where this comes in. So we take a virus um, and we take out all those bad genes that make it um, able to replicate and cause bad symptoms in a patient. And we stuff it with the DNA that we want to um, get into the patient's cells to fix the errors. Um, and then we just manufacture these up into bulk. And there's another little bit on this slide. Um, and how we do this is the vector carries that desired DNA um, and it targets patient cells. And it then um, transports that DNA into the nucleus where it kind of knocks out that mutated gene, which then produces a therapeutic protein, which helps cure a disease. Next slide, please. Um, so, a typical week in my company, I work in process R&D, where we do process development. Um, and 
the way we make vaccines and viral vectors and therapies is it starts with upstream. So we produce our viruses. We take a small batch of cells and grow these up into millions and making sure that that DNA is in those cells from the viruses. Um, and then once we've grown them into millions, we have to purify this product. So we have to take out all the residual DNAs, proteins, host cell debris, just so we just so we know that um, the product is safe enough to go into patients so that it won't cause sort of really bad reactions or make patients even more ill. Um, and the way we do this is we filter through membranes um, using automated machines, filters that pull out these residuals. Um, and we take samples from both these upstream and downstream processes and we test these in, an, in our analytics team. So we look for the levels of DNA protein that might be harmful to patients um, to determine if the product is safe. Next slide, please. Uh, so next I want to talk about the apprenticeships we offer at Oxford Biomedica. Um, it starts at level three and we go all the way up to level seven, but I haven't included level seven on this slide um, just because it's a master's degree and it's a bit more advanced. Um, but if you're finishing school, you can look into doing a level three laboratory assistant um, apprenticeship. And it's an A-level equivalent, takes place over 24 months, um, and you'll get involved in laboratory management teams. So you'll be in charge of, um, and you'll be trained to make reagents, ensure that laboratory stock levels are up to scratch, um, and you'll just ensure that the daily operations of the lab can take place. We also offer a level four quality practitioner role. Um, this is equivalent to a higher national certificate. It takes place over 14 months and you'll be trained um, in our quality control practices um, and we need um, to do quality control to make sure that our products we produce are um, regular, which makes sure that our products can get to market. Um, and next we do the level five technician scientist apprenticeship, which I'm on. Um, it's most popular as you can start doing a foundation degree straight out of A levels. Um, this apprenticeship takes place over 30 to 36 months and you'll be trained and guided to a scientist level. Um, I get involved in laboratory experiments um, most weeks. Um, I've been trained in data analysis and I've been left in charge to um, manage projects um, and you're trained to do this along the way. The step up from that is um, a level six um, laboratory scientist, which is biology based or a level six science industry process and plant engineer, which is more chemical engineering um, geared. And these are both, these are equivalent to bachelor's degrees, um, which take place over four and a half to five years. Um, and you'll be trained um, a bit more technically into a specialist role. Um, you'll do scientific investigations. You will try and um, problem solve um, solutions in our labs to help with our process development. Um, you'll evaluate data, you will, get more heavily involved in project management um, and you'll be performing more novel um, experiments, so new ideas, um, and you'll be expected to work more independently because you'll be trained to that level. Next slide, please. I just want to talk a bit about um, our training um, providers. So we are partnered with CSR, um, which is where the level three laboratory assistant apprenticeship um, you're able to complete a BTEC level three diploma in applied science. This takes place over two years. You need five GCSEs, um, grade C or four and above, um, and you are required to have maths, English and science. This is delivered both by distance learning, so on an online platform, and they even do face-to-face -face interaction at the Oxford Training Center. I go to the University of Kent. I'm a student there doing the Applied Bioscience Foundation degree. And they also provide the level six laboratory science, applied bioscience um, bachelor's degree. Um, I needed five GCSEs, level C, all four and above, and three A levels, including chemistry and biology. I didn't have chemistry. Um, so when you do consider to do an apprenticeship and you haven't chosen these A levels, if you're there at that point, um, my company was also considering um, experience you had. And like I said, I did a gap year um, at a nanotech company. So that really helped me um, get the apprenticeship without having that chemistry subject. Um, so apprenticeships can be experience-based um, and tailored. Um, it's mostly distant learning. So I um, do all my work on a platform called Moodle where I'll have slides, pre-recorded lectures, um, quizzes, to do and you also get a week every year to go to a summer school where you'll be assessed to do practical um, <clears throat> assessments to make sure that my company is teaching me what I need to know and at the end of um, the degree I can register to become a registered scientist with the Science Council of Registered Scientists. 
The chemical engineering degree is provided by the University of Strathclyde, takes place over five years. You need A-levels and GCSEs. Um, the A-levels you are a bit more stricter, you need an A and two Bs. Um, and you can become a registered chemical engineer. And this is also distant learning because it's all up in Scotland. Um, so the commute from Oxford to Scotland is quite, would be quite heavy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I mentioned Catapult. Um, Catapult is a company that tries that aims to bridge the gap between academia and industry. Um, a branch of Catapult is ATAC, um, and ATAC helps support apprentices during our um, apprenticeship journeys. They do this by organizing um, external networking and training events. Um, I've attended lunch and learns where we get industry speakers in um, to talk about their experiences. A lot of them have been past apprentices, um, which is really good to see the success of apprentices. Um, they've put build your brand um, on LinkedIn sessions, virtual reality manufacturing training, continuous improvement training with NHS blood and transplant. And we're able to go on tours um, to industry leading facilities. Next slide, please. So I just want to talk about what I've sort of completed so far in my apprenticeship. Um, as I said, I'm on the applied bioscience level five apprenticeship course. Um, I joined Oxford Biomedica after the pandemic, which is a bit weird trying to get used to full time work after a virus outbreak. Um, I was trained as a lab technician for six months, so I was shown how to correctly prepare laboratories and reagents. I then was trained for 11 months as an analytical scientist, where I was able to do what we call an assay, which is an experiment um, to determine residual uh, levels. Um, and I was able to analyze data. I also completed my first work-based project, um, which has given me good practice for my endpoint assessment, which I'll talk about in a second. My plans for, sorry, <laughs> there's, a little, uh, there's a little bit on the bottom of that slide. <laughs> so my plans for 2023, I've moved to the downstream team where I talked about purification earlier. Um, I'll be trained more heavily in data analysis too. And I'll do my work-based project, which has a 500, uh, 5,000 word report attached to it, which is sort of like a replacement of a dissertation. Um, and that will allow me to finish my apprenticeship as well as my endpoint assessment, where my endpoint assess assessment company will assess wherever I've got the correct skills and competencies, and if I've been trained correctly, and they'll um, determine this through an interview. And then I'll be able to um, your endpoint assessment will give you a gateway to a higher apprenticeship level, or it will just give you your apprenticeship award. Next slide, please. Quick question, Erin. So once, we, like it says there, gateway to level six, and you said earlier mm. that level six uh, is the equivalent to um, a degree. When we say equivalent, what I want to make clear to parents is we, we use the word equivalent, but once you finish level six, and let's say, Erin, go, you go on to do your level six and you get your bachelor's of science. It's a, de it's a degree. It's, it's the same mm, as yeah. you get from university. You get your degree. <laughs> so when we say equivalent, it's the same. You're just not getting it by going to university. You're getting it yeah. by doing through an apprenticeship. And it is, it is the same degree. So because one of the parents has asked, oh, you know, is it similar? Is it different? Are you just getting the experience? No, you're actually getting the same degree but just not going to university for it and paying the tuition fees, you're going via a different route. But then Erin, that question around pay, I don't need you to tell us how much you get paid. But when you look at what you're doing, is it higher than the £4.61? Is it higher than the minimum? Yes, it's, uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> it's quite a bit. Um, and it goes up every year. Um, so my salary goes up with the more experience I gain. Um, oh, yeah. So I, I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of Good. apprenticeships and what I think they are. Um, the cons, I'd say it's less social than university. Um, a lot of students like to go to university for that social aspect, meeting new people, which you will do if you go to a, into a company. Um, but there are no societies, although a lot of our departments do put on social events for the employees. Apprenticeships are highly competitive. Um, so I would do your research and apply early. Um, there are fewer positions compared to a uni course. Um, so I just look out for that. It's a large commitment. So you'll go into, a, I do a 35 hour working week where I do one day studying um, and I don't get breaks at the end of semester. So my study day happens once every week, um, but I do get holiday entitlement. Uh, the pros, I get four and a half years experience compared to someone that just goes to university um, full stop. Um, I get involved in industry leading projects and I work with clients. Um, I don't get a university debt. Um, debt. My tuition fees are paid for through our tax company's tax levy. Um, I get paid a salary. I get company benefits um, such as private healthcare, cycle to work scheme, and I'm able to get bonuses. 
And at the end of my apprenticeship, my CV is going to look really professional, um, which is more attractive to employers. Um, I'm also surrounded by a good network of professionals too, which helps aid my training. That, that was me, apologies for that. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, but yeah, I'd say do your, do your research into apprenticeships and university is not the only option. That's what I'll finish with. So it's good, it's good, good to see the pros and cons. And that's what, you know, parents, when you look at this and you will have a lot of questions because these are new, listen to what apprentices say to you, listen to what the people who are doing apprenticeships are saying and listen to the pros and cons. And then it's for students, you need to go out and think about, listen to those, what's right for me? Because we're not here to say that university is better than apprenticeships or apprenticeships is better than university. It just means there's a place for everyone and you need to learn and work out which one is right for you. Because when I was at school, apprenticeships didn't exist so the only way to get a degree was via university now that the 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 field has changed things have changed so it's about learning what's right so listen to what apprentices tell you because they are the ones experiencing and going through those experiences themselves um which is fantastic and erin just genuinely thank you so much for sharing that information and what you do one of the things that i will say is that uh, i want to ask you when you applied for your apprenticeship and did you think that you were going to be doing the things that you actually get involved in? Because one of the things that people say to me is when you do an apprenticeship, you don't actually do any real work. You're part of the team, but you don't do any real work. Is that what you thought? And is it being different? Uh, going into it, I did think I was going to do sort of more simpler stuff just because I, I'm, I've not got a degree um, and it's quite highly technical. But straight away, I was getting thrown into sort of development projects, getting um just trusted to get hands on with the work in the labs um and if I messed up it wasn't a problem um so yeah no I'm getting more experience than I think I would get definitely cool and you so you've heard it there straight from an apprentice thank you very much for that appreciate it so the next person that we're going to meet the last person that we're meeting and we're going we're clicking off a lot of those questions that are coming through which is fantastic so do keep them coming through as well it's from the University of Oxford and like I said why are we meeting somebody from the University of Oxford if we're talking about apprenticeships? Uh, so Ellie, welcome to the session. Come talk to us. Thank you. Um, so my name is Ellie Knight. I'm currently a level three HR apprentice at the University of Oxford. Um, and just to kind of like Max says, you know, the university, like, why am I here? Um, as many of you will know, obviously the university does um, offer degrees. That's sort of our main business purpose. But at the end of the day, we are still a business, so we still need members of staff to keep everything running. So to kind of put it simply, I'm sort of part of the background. And I suppose in that sense, I kind of help it run in sort of, you know, behind the scenes. But um, yeah, I thought I'd sort of chat through my experience as an apprentice and also sort of how I got here. Um, so in 2019, I finished secondary school with my GCSEs. Um, and to be quite frank, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do in terms of career. I sort of had no no dream job, no sort of vision for the future. Um, and sort of when I was in year 11, I really didn't have much information about apprenticeships. Um, I sort of realised a little bit too late that it was the sort of thing that I wanted to do. Um, and, you know, as I was sort of 16, I had to stay in education. So I went with my sort of easiest and best option, which was my school's sick form. Um, and I tried this out for two weeks and I realised it really was not for me. And... I just couldn't sort of see myself doing that for two years. So I then sort of looked at other options um, and I found a level three events and tourism course at Abingdon and Whitney College. Um, and, you know, again, to be honest, one of my friends was doing it. I thought it seemed like a better option. Um, I would have finished it with a BTEC in business. So I thought that's quite a transferable sort of qualification. I'll sort of try that out. Um, next slide, please. So, I was about halfway through my first year of that course when I found um, my first apprenticeship, which was a level three in business administration um, at the University of Oxford in the finance division. And I was sort of umming and ahhing because I kind of didn't want to sort of change what I was doing again. Um, but I kind of thought I've got nothing to lose. So I did apply for it and I was successful with that. Um, so alongside starting this apprenticeship, I finished off all the work of my first year just so that that sort of first half of the year didn't go to waste um and sort of just to point out like most of my apprenticeship was done during the pandemic so that was quite an adaption and that did sort of change my job role quite a lot to what it would have been had you know the pandemic not happened um and I actually first went into the office in August 2021 so I did 18 months of my apprenticeship from home which it was such a weird thing at first but I 
I kind of very quickly got used to it. And I think one of the sort of biggest skills I've sort of, um, I suppose, gained from my first apprenticeship was just the ability to adapt and to change, um, you know, as priorities change, as sort of um, tasks change, you know, simply because of the pandemic and kind of, yeah, I just had to go with it. Um, so I completed my level three business administration apprenticeship in December 2021. Um, and I then moved on to what I'm doing now. So, yeah, so I still work for the University of Oxford in the finance division. I'm still in the same team, um, but I'm sort of moved more into the HR area. So in January last year now, I started a level three apprenticeship in HR. Um, so completing my level three CIPD, which this is the qualification needed in the HR industry. And um, I have to say, HR, I just would have never sort of thought that would be something I'd want to do or even it sort of wouldn't have even crossed my mind. But doing my first apprenticeship sort of gave me the opportunity to do this. Um, and HR has become such a big industry, but equally, it's quite a hard industry to get into. So I think this apprenticeship that I'm doing now has given me a really good sort of foundation for building a career in HR. Um, next slide, please. Um, I just want to pick up on one thing there. I mean, HR, I worked in HR as well, but it's it's huge. Every every company has an HR department and it goes across everything that we do across every industry. It's a really, really important function. Um, and also it says there about your level three CIPD. Um, mm -hmm. you, you, if you were to go to university, you wouldn't be able to study for that at the same time. Let's say you did go to university to do a degree in HR. You'd have to get your degree, then go and get a job in a workplace and then go and study your CIPD levels. Whereas doing it through an apprenticeship, you can gain that apprenticeship qualification and the CIPD at the same time because you are doing a real job. So um, actually, Ellie, when you think about it, you've put yourself in a much better position and done well to, to do that as well. So fantastic. Um, so just a kind of quick points of why I chose an apprenticeship. Um, like I sort of mentioned earlier, I didn't really have much information when I left school, but um, I kind of realised that it was what I wanted to do. Um, I'm quite a hands on learner and visual. So as much as um, I sort of don't mind learning in the classroom, I do prefer if I can sort of learn things in the classroom and then actually put that into practice, because I do think that it's a lot easier to sort of remember how to do things and pick things up when you can sort of physically do it. Um, and yeah, I never really sort of considered university. I didn't have anything that I wanted to pursue. Um, and yeah, I, to be honest, it was just sort of never something that crossed my mind, um, even though sort of at school that was sort of the, you know, only route to go down. Um, and yeah, as a lot of people say, I chose to earn and learn instead. And, you know, I'm coming up to sort of three years being an apprentice. It's been a really, really good decision for me. Um, next slide, please. Um, I also just wanted to chat quickly about the support that I've received during my apprenticeships, because I know that for some people it can seem really daunting because, you know, at the end of the day, it is a full time job. You are doing a qualification. Um, but I just kind of want to reassure you that you have the most support, you know, in the world, the most support that you could ask for. So I think one of the biggest sort of fears that I think a lot of people have is sort of what, you know, what are your parents going to think? What are um, family going to think about doing an apprenticeship? Um, my family have been really great and very supportive in my decision to go down the apprenticeship route. Um, my manager at work and my team have been really, really amazing. Um, you know, they, they're very aware that I'm an apprentice. I don't know anything. Um, you know, it's normal to have questions and they've been great at sort of helping me and talking me through things and, you know, teaching me um, how to do my job. Um, also from the college side of things. So um, depending on your apprenticeship, you might have an assessor, a training coordinator or a tutor or, in my case, when I did business administration, I had all three and I honestly couldn't have got through my first apprenticeship without them because they were very, very supportive and they really just talked through everything and sort of helped me um, to ensure that I had everything that I needed for my endpoint assessment. And then in my current apprenticeship, um, I have a training coordinator and a tutor. And again, they've been very, very supportive. And I know they're just sort of a team's message away if I have any questions about anything. Um, next slide, please. Um, and just a couple of top tips. The biggest thing is just to do research because I think apprenticeships are great, but if you have one in mind, it's really, really important to actually research what's that, what that is going to involve. Um, because for me, I think one of the biggest reasons that I've sort of enjoyed my apprenticeship is because 
I've sort of you know I knew what it was going to involve I knew that it would be the sort of thing that would work for me um, and it makes it a lot easier to get up and go to work every day when you enjoy what you do um, the other thing is sort of similar but to research future careers so if you know that there's a role that you really really want to do in the future it's really good to sort of research that the apprenticeship that you're looking at is going to help you to get there um, because as much as an apprenticeship is great on your CV if you have a specific idea um, having the right apprenticeship sort of behind you is going to really sort of be the stepping stone to sort of get to where you want to be um, I think that might be everything yeah thank you for listening thank you for speaking I, I said it a, a second ago to parents listen to what apprentices say and you've heard it from apprentices themselves and listen to uh, Ellie and how she speaks about the support that she's given they want her to be successful companies run apprenticeships because they want bright young talent in their company and not everybody is right for university but has amazing qualities and is just are just as good and can get that degree and they want to be hands-on and they want to be getting involved in work I mean, you've just heard from two apprentices and what they do. These are real jobs. These are real things that they're doing. And these are available in the Oxfordshire area. These, these aren't available elsewhere in the country. There are, but this is in Oxfordshire. This is the important thing to remember. OK, so those opportunities are there. Let's open that world up. There's been a lot of questions that have come through for everybody. So, Ellie, thank you for sharing your story. Story Really, really appreciate it because listening to you speak is what will hopefully make other students realise that apprenticeships are for them and they are worth doing couple of questions that we've got and let's just clarify a few things somebody did ask so when you finish a degree apprenticeship do you actually have a degree or not or have you just done work in a company and what qualification do you end up with with a degree apprenticeship you end up with the same degree as you would get from university but you're just putting it into practice on a day-to-day -day basis as you go through it same with level seven you finish with a master's okay but the other levels, the level twos, the level threes, four on their own, they are nationally recognised qualifications. OK, Hannah, can you explain that a little bit more when we talk about nationally recognised qualifications? Because a degree is easy to understand. OK, at the end of it, I've got a degree like uni. But then what are the what does it mean to be nationally recognised? Yep. So I'll talk about our level two and our level three. So Please. level two intermediate apprenticeship, which is brilliant for a year 11 lever. You get it's called the community activator coach. It's a it's a proper certificate, government stamp on it, accredited, nationally recognised that you are a level two sports coach and have passed the assessment, which is a national assessment. It's not one that we do. We're not assessing it. We're not marking our own homework. Someone external is coming in from an endpoint assessing agency and saying this candidate is at the industry expected level to be considered a pass or distinction. They, it's it's industry re uh, recognized so whether it's level two three four five six seven you're, you're assessed externally and that means that you are operating at that industry recognized level it's not mickey mouse it's real stuff and with some of the higher level apprenticeships as well you get bolt-on technical qualifications as well but your standard your certificate your apprenticeship standard certificate no one can dispute its validity at all and, and the point that you made earlier as well is valid because with those level twos and level threes, it's not just like okay, I've done with level two and level three. Now, if I want to go to university, well, I've got to go and do A-levels or a B-tech. No, it takes you on to university or into a degree apprenticeship, right? Absolutely. It can take you to, on your education journey and also it stands alone on its own two feet as well. So you've got, you've got both options. Because somebody has asked, and it's a valid question. So if a student just completed GCSE, right, which level would the student join? And you could do level two or level three. And the question is, because if students need to consider and attend all the levels, how long would it take to achieve that degree? But I think if we did a rough calculation, it could be six years to achieve that degree after GCSE. Would that be right? Leah, you're nodding your head. Yeah, I think I think I read um, earlier, actually, it could take six years to get through those levels. So when you Which think is about realistic that, if you think about if you did it through A levels and school and then go into university, it's the same time, isn't it? Absolutely. That's what we need to think about. Um, look at it that way, because if you finish your GCSEs and this is for students as well, if you finish your GCSEs or you're finishing them and you think, well, I don't want to do A levels because I'm done with that kind of learning or maybe my industry isn't right for A levels and I still want to get a degree in it and I want to go far. You can finish your GCSEs, move into level two, level three apprenticeship, which will then take you on to level four, five, six. And once you finish six and you're qualified, you have your degree in hand. That may take you six years, but you heard it from Erin and Ellie, what they are getting, 
work experience and a salary and no debt behind them. So you do, let's say it takes you two, two and a half, three years to do that level two and level three hypothesis. Okay. You'll be paid a salary and you're getting work experience and that salary is going up and up and your work experience is getting more and more. And then you move on to do level four, five and six and your salary goes up and up and your experience goes up and up. And at the end of six years, you stand there with a degree in your hand. Let's be blunt for a second. If a, if a, a degree, a graduate comes out of university holding a degree and says, I'm 21, I've got my degree now. And it only took me three years after A-levels, I've got my degree. But then the apprentice stands there and says, yeah, it took me six years after GCSE, but I've got six years work experience behind me as well and a degree. You've just got the degree. So there's a big advantage. And you heard it from Erin and Ellie talking about what they do on a daily basis. Come on, that is real stuff. That's real work in real companies. So that's that's what you need to think about when you look at the levels and look at the time that it takes. Patience, life is long takes the time it takes but look at the qualifications you get with that there is a question for you erin did you join after you did your a levels or your gcse's so i joined after i did my a levels um but i did do a gap year between um starting my apprenticeship and finishing a levels so what did you do in your gap year so i worked as a lab technician for a nanotech company so i was still getting heavily involved in lab work um which sort of gave me sort of the one up on other applicants as well when i applied for my apprenticeship because i already had some sort of basic skills um but yeah um you can join straight after a levels if you really want to as well fantastic that's the important thing to know you can join straight after a levels go and take a gap year if you want do what do what erin did or you can go and travel the what do whatever you want but do something useful that's going to give you some skills now I've got a question. Uh, it's a this is a good one actually. I've not come across this before, but when you look at the higher level apprenticeships, are there any that are part time or that could cater to somebody with disabilities that not that might not be able to fulfil a full time role? Where do apprenticeships lie within the law around accessibility and stuff like that? Hannah, I'm looking at you. Are you best placed to answer this? I'll give you my answer, and then I reckon Leah is probably the technical person for this sorry Leah so if we have someone who comes to us with additional needs regardless of the level of apprenticeship they're looking at we will we, we pride ourselves on being inclusive and looking at what, what what we need to put in to support them so as an employer and a training provider we we have additional funding to be able to support that learner and employer employee to be the, to, to achieve and to be successful and then the other thing that we everyone is able to do regardless of level is your employer and your training provider together should only put the learner through their endpoint assessment and there's a process called putting you through gateway you should only do that when that person is ready because we want to you set you up for success not failure so if i look at a typical level two community activator coach apprenticeship we have the minimum time we can put that candidate through gateway is after 12 months now, typically, it's about a month to sort out their endpoint assessment. So typically, it's about 13 months to 14 months completion for a level two apprenticeship. But it can't be any less than 12. But if our learner or our, our member of staff isn't ready, and it has to be 15 months, 16 months, 18 months, that's absolutely fine because it's individualised to meet the needs of that person and for them to be successful. Because the endpoint assessment is not about catching out what you don't know. It's about catching what you do know. Brilliant. There's a, there's a supplementary bit to that as well in a second, but Leah, let's get what you say on this as well. I'm just going to agree with Hannah. I think you'll find that um, all training providers are inclusive, as will employers be. I suppose it's slightly different in that when A-levels take two years and there's really not much flexibility there, there probably is more so with an apprenticeship to, to um, take, take into account any needs that there are. So as Hannah says, it can be extended. Um, I think it's a conversation both between employer, training provider and the apprentice. And you'll find that app apprenticeships are great for that kind of three-way agreement and communication. So I yeah. Yeah, wouldn't be put off at all. No. I definitely wouldn't. And what, what I will say on top of that is that um, apprenticeships are governed by the same laws. I mean, it, the, the law applies everywhere. It's not you can't pick and choose. But the point about um, uh, in apprenticeships, what we need to understand is if you go and do an apprenticeship at any level, 
you're being paid a salary to do a real job. So when that question came in earlier, what happens at the end? Those stats that I believe it was Leah that gave us as well um, about, you know, how many people remain employed and go and carry on to do a, a full time job. When you start an apprenticeship, you're employed in a job. You have a work contract. Normally it's permanent. There's no end date. So once you've qualified, your pay, your pay goes up. Oh, you're now qualified. So your pay goes up again. Why would a company want to get rid of you? They've just invested all this money in you and trained you. They don't want to get rid of you to one of their competitors. Similarly, on the other side, they want to make sure that you're successful. That doesn't mean that you are rushed through your qualifications. That doesn't mean that you're rushed through the levels just to tick some boxes. No, if it takes a little bit longer because you need extra support, that's absolutely fine because you need it. They've invested in you. They want you mm -hmm. to be successful. So look at those things as well. If you go into an interview or you go and join a company and you don't get that feeling, then run away and go and join a different one that is going to treat you right. Especially in an interview, if you get that feeling that you're not going to be respected or the adjustments are not going to be made, or even if you ask for it in an interview and adjustments are not being made, I would question why you would want to join that company. So do think about it. There's lots of opportunities available. We saw how many vacancies are available just this week. Okay. Um, and there was one, one last question and one last confusion we need to clear up before we finish the session for this evening because we're doing this again tomorrow so if any of you think this is awesome i need i know people who need to see this we're doing this again tomorrow night the confusion is this why would you be applying now if these apprenticeships start in september whether that be at a level or at gcse why why would you apply now if they start in september go on hannah i can see you go for it Um, so a few thoughts on that. So um, most, a lot of a lot of apprenticeships do roll a, a September to June, July. So what I call in line with the academic year. So if you are a, a, looking to be leaving school or college this summer, then applications for September. It's not too early to apply for September now. It's we're all recruiting. I'm recruiting. I've got a couple of apprentices coming next, or potential apprentices coming next week for taster days here in February half term. Where we find a brilliant candidate, our principle is, is to get in early with an offer, secure that young person. They then can settle ahead of GCSEs or A-levels, don't have to worry. Our offers are, I'm talking on behalf of ourselves now, but often not conditional on results because you already heard me say it's about the person rather than necessarily the academia. So apply now, it's perfect for the September start date. However, also woods and it's very competitive so get in early and jan february is not too early what i would also say to anyone who's sitting here most apprenticeships a lot we also take in year as well we have we call about it's rolling on and rolling off so you, we can actually start an apprentice apprentice at any point during the year and then they do their 12 14 15 months from their start date so as employers and training providers we're not all wedded to the academic year. So if you're unhappy at school or college or it's mid-year, don't think, oh God, I've got to wait till September before anything comes up. That's not the case. Stuff does come up all the time, but a lot also do start in September. Absolutely. I did say it was the last question, but I lied because one question that just came in that is an absolute stonker of a question. Um, and this is why we do these sessions for parents is so that you can understand this and go away with the right knowledge. And the question is, is this, and, and somebody has been honest, you said, I don't quite understand it. How do we say that a, a degree apprenticeship is equivalent to a university degree if you're working 80 percent of the time and only studying 20 percent? Are you studying less learning content than a full time student on a university degree? I'll give you my bit first and then we go to the, the other experts. Um, remember that when you go to university, you don't study in lectures for 37 and a half hours a week. When I was at university, I was doing maybe 16 hours a week. And that was only because I did two languages and because of the modules. My friend who did an English language degree, uh, excuse me, English literature degree, he was doing three hours of lectures a week. So that kind of get that. And that was his full time study. So you need to think about it that way. Degree apprenticeships and apprenticeships are worked in line with companies and institutions to deliver the right content at the right pace that is relevant for that organization, for that, that area. So when you take a law degree, for example, the law that you study, you then apply in your job 80% of the time. So you're studying the same law that you would at university, module to module. You're then putting it into practice in your work. That's what you do in the 80% of the time. OK, so it's not that you're studying less. It's worked in collaboration with the government, with those organizations, the universities and the companies to say, this is what we need them to have learned to be able to call it a degree. And it is fully accredited. OK, there's nothing weird about it. It's fully accredited. Um, I'm going to ask you, Hannah, because because uh, I know that you're through training provider knowledge. 
Um, that's exactly how it works across all levels, isn't it? Exactly. And I think you, you, the way I look at it is you, you might be in a lesson or in a lecture or you're reading textbooks or writing stuff, which is one way of learning. And that suits many people. But the other way of learning is hands dirty, sleeves rolled up, doing the job, whether it's in the lab, on the pitch, in the, in the studio, in the, in the factory. So you're, you're learning the skills and not you're get, we talk about knowledge, skills and behaviours. You're gaining that through the practical, practical experience, which for someone like me works much better than me reading it off a textbook. So I think I don't think it's they're both different, different people learn in different ways. And also when you get to your endpoint assessment, again, I'll just talk about hours, but I think they're all pretty similar across the sectors. There is a theoretical element, i.e. you've got to write. I've heard Erin, I think, say up to 5,000 words for a level six apprenticeship, I think I heard. There is a Q&A professional discussion interview, which is like an oral uh, assessment for the ones we do. And then there's a practical observation to actually see you doing the job. So with an apprenticeship, you, you, you assess knowledge, skills and behaviours to prove that you, your certificate is evidence that you actually can do all those. So different ways of learning and practical demonstration of the skills rather than theoretical gets you to the same endpoint, slightly different route. Brilliant. Yeah, I completely Fantastic. agree with what Hannah said there. You summed that up perfectly. Fantastic. Well, that's pretty much all of the questions answered. And we have, I know we have gone over time, but there's a lot of questions come from a lot of parents and a lot of you have stuck around. Last poll, we asked you some questions at the beginning. Answer these honestly, launching it now. You'll see it on your screen. Following tonight's session, how much more do you actually know about apprenticeships? Is it a whole lot more, a fair amount more, but there's still more to learn? Or would you just know a little bit more? Because I understand that this can be a little bit confusing, especially when it's introduced to you for the first time. That's why we're here to support you through the different organisations that have spoken this evening, through Oxlep, through Pathway CTM. There's plenty of resources out there. And then following tonight's session, which route are you or your child thinking of taking after leaving school or college? Same options apply. University degree, degree apprenticeship, straight into work, other level apprenticeship, gap year. Do they inspire you all to take, go and take a gap year? Or are you still not sure? This is one session, this is one hour, one hour 20 now, but it's one session and it's an open, it's a gateway opening. Go and explore those resources and learn more and you will get more information. Go and talk to more people doing apprenticeships. Go and find out what the real situation is, okay? Somebody did say they wish that some of this was coming down into schools about how we all learn differently. This is why we're here tonight because we believe it and we do want to talk about it and we want to push this because we do all learn differently, okay? But it's getting there, okay? Um, and whilst you are answering the poll, somebody asked, is it harder to get into an apprenticeship than it is to get into uni? Let me put it this way. At university, there's tens of thousands of places available. Because let's be blunt, they want your money. They're going to put an extra bench at the end of the table because that's another £9,000 every year. Your competition, if you're applying for an apprenticeship, your competition is not university places. Your competition is graduate roles. If you go to university to get a degree you will be applying for a graduate role at the end of your university years because you, you should go to university, get a degree, apply for a graduate role. You wouldn't do anything less. The ISC stats show that for every one graduate role available in England, there are roughly 100 people applying, 100 graduates applying for every one graduate role. But apprenticeships in England, for every one apprenticeship role available, there's roughly 35 to 40 people applying for every one apprenticeship role. So there's a lot more competition at graduate level than there is at apprenticeship level across England. So think about that. A university, it's unfair because they will just, they have places and spaces to take you. It's the after bit that you need to worry about. So let's share the results of the poll. So 36% know a whole lot more, 61% know a fair amount more, and 2% know a little bit more and still got research to do. Great. Following tonight's session, what are you thinking of doing? Or what is your child thinking of doing? 9% are thinking about a university degree, 25% are thinking degree apprenticeship, 18% other level apprenticeship, 5% gap year, 43% still not sure. Take your time, go and do the research and learn and make your decisions, okay? Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. I think we've done a good job. Um, it sounds like it. And we're doing it again tomorrow evening. Erin, Ellie, Leah, Hannah, thank you so much for coming along tonight and sharing your time and your expertise with everybody. Really, really appreciate it. You're welcome. So there you are.
go and use the resources, go and check things out. People need to see this, tell them about our session tomorrow night. And for those of you that are coming tomorrow night for the same again to learn more, fantastic. We'll see you there. Thank you very much.